Hi, I'm Ryan Lizza. I'm the Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. And with me today is Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood. Thanks for uh, being with us. We Thank really you. appreciate it. So uh, for our viewers that don't know about you, just tell us the, your backstory. Tell us how you ended up being in the Obama administration, or at least in well, his cabinet starts, anyway. Well, it starts really with a 30-year congressional career as uh, 19 years as a staffer and 14 years as a member of the U.S. House from Illinois, where I got to know Barack Obama, who was When did you meet him? Uh, after he got elected to the Senate, he called me, and for two years, while he was a U.S. Senator from Illinois and, and, and I was serving in the U.S. House, uh, we worked together on transportation issues and a lot of, for Illinois. You know, we really worked together. Real good bipartisan uh, chemistry developed. A, a few days before the, uh, his election to the White House, uh, his uh, then-to-be chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who was also a very good friend, he and I had a wonderful friendship during our time in the House together. We would have these bipartisan dinners where he'd invite a few Democrats. Oh, you were I'd, part of that group. This is, yeah, this, this, yeah, right. right. That's right. So you over and Rom hosted this, right? We did. We'd yeah. go over at the Monocle and drink a little wine, have a steak, and commiserate with, uh, with one another and develop great relationships. Then when, I, when, you know, when they called and said, What were you planning on doing? I, I had no idea. Yeah. No, I had no idea. You just my won wife, re My wife thought I was going to make a lot of money. Well, you were done, right? You were out. I, well, I was about to be done, Did yeah. you know when you took the job that this stimulus was in the pipeline and that the Department of Transportation would actually be overseeing this huge I did know that there money. was going to be a yeah. stimulus program because yeah. I had been in discussions with some of the folks that were going to be at OMB. Mm -hmm. They were calling me saying, what do you think about this amount? Uh, you know, should it be higher? And, you know, some things like that. So I knew there was going to be a stimulus. I, I, I didn't know how much it was going to be and, and certainly not, didn't know all the details. But the fact is they were consulting with me about a few of my ideas about it. And so tell us about that. The, the, the Department, I don't know if our, our people watching this know, but the Department of Transportation oversees how many billions of dollars of stimulus well, we have money? A set, well, it, the, the, the stimulus uh, was $48 billion of the $780 billion. Yeah. And as a result of that, right now as we're sitting here, there are 14,000 projects. That means 14,000 Roads, bridges, runways, uh, transit districts, a, a whole bunch of people, uh, thousands of people are working that would not have been working if it hadn't been for the economic recovery. So, uh, tell, us, tell us about this. I mean, there's so much conversation about the, the, the stimulus, and it's sure. become this political football. But you actually had to oversee this huge amount of, uh, of money. There was all sorts of controversy at the beginning uh, over whether there were enough shovel-ready projects right. to go, and some people saying, why can't the government spend this fast enough? Yeah. And it seemed like lots of bureaucratic hurdles to getting the money out the door. Um, tell us about what you encountered. I've been to over 80 cities in the country in the last 18 months, and everywhere I go, I see people working. They're very thankful. And almost every one of them says thank you because I would not be working if it hadn't been for the economic recovery. I wouldn't be working without the stimulus yeah. money. And so this idea that it didn't work or it wasn't spent fast enough is, is all nonsense, particularly for people who are working, building roads, building bridges, building runways, uh, or people that are working in transit districts, or people that are actually building buses as a result of the fact that we gave money to transit districts. And... Uh, this was a job creator yeah. for America. No question people, about it. People always ask, inevitably, this, this stimulus gets compared to what FDR did with, mm -hmm. with federal spending. And people are always curious about, where's the Hoover Dam of the Obama administration? What are the projects that Americans will remember from the Obama era? High-speed rail? High-speed rail. $8 billion investment? Yeah. Eight billion times more than we've ever had in this country? That's the president's vision. That's the vice president's vision. We've never had $8 and billion, dollars. The, and we've uh, never had this much discussion in America about high-speed intercity rail. I mean, that, that's going to be a great transportation legacy. What's the Hoover Dam of the high-speed rail money? Is it in California? Where, where, where well, is maybe it? it's the bridge that we're going to go dedicate here in the next month or so uh, that connects two states uh, and uh, is right near the Hoover Dam. Okay. You know, that, 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 that's, you know that, that's a part of it. I mean, you're looking for big projects. Yeah. There, there are. Or is that the wrong way to look at it? Is, is the point of it that you don't fund big projects because you want to spread the money across the, well, the, the country? Well, the point was we had $28 billion for yeah. roads and bridges, and that money is out the door. It's being spent. Thousands of people are working. A lot of projects are going on. 
that would have been sitting on a shelf. Uh, they, they got funded. Over a, a billion dollars in money for runways all over America. Transit districts got eight billion dollars. New buses, new bus facilities. All, every, all of this put people to work. And then, of course, the high-speed rail, which will be President Obama's transportation legacy. You're the only Republican in this cabinet. The stimulus and some of the other po uh, policies that Obama mm -hmm. has, uh, has, has put forward obviously created, you know, it can only be described as a, as a backlash in, in the Republican Party uh, against this president. What has it been like watching that develop from within the Obama administration? I mean, do you ever talk to your Republican colleague, of course. Ex colleagues in the House yeah, and say, you know, what's, what do they not understand about this administration that you see uh, up close? What I think people don't realize, yeah. which is what I know, is that my Republican friends that I served with one time... Because uh, the stimulus is not once, popular with those one, guys. <laughs> one, once in the House, well, publicly it may not be popular, but I can tell you when my phone rings and it's a Republican congressman, yeah. they're not calling to complain about the stimulus. They're calling to say, could you help get some funding for this project in my district? That's and I've seen a lot of Republicans at ribbon cuttings yeah. and scooping the shovel of dirt when it comes time for a stimulus project to get going. Same so, guys that voted against it and campaigned against it? Same guys that voted against it. You know why? Because it's providing jobs in their districts, it's putting people to work, and it's improving infrastructure. I've never had a member, a Republican member of Congress call me and say, hey, Ray, this is a lousy idea. What I get is, hey, Ray, could you help get this project funded? Because yeah. it means jobs. It's something that's been sitting on a shelf. Uh, so... Yeah. Look at so, what, what, what's been said publicly is not an, a, an accurate reflection of how people feel, Republicans and Democrats, because they know our portion of the stimulus is working in America. Yeah. So there, 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 there are very few congressmen out there who don't accept the funds when it's uh, going to fix a road or a bridge. I don't know district. of any. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't. You know, there were a few Republican governors in the beginning who said, oh, we're not taking the money. Yeah. Every state has taken the money and has yeah. spent it. And it's been a wise use of money. Yeah. Because it's fixing up the infrastructure and, most importantly, putting people to work. One of your signature issues, uh, besides the, the overseeing this, this infrastructure spending, has been uh, educating the public about texting while mm -hmm. driving, uh, which is some, sometimes I think people think of as, oh, that's a frivolous issue. Why is the, why is the administration spending so much time on that? But it's, it's quite serious. What got you involved in that? We, we just we, we heard some heart-wrenching stories. And we decided that we wanted to really go after this issue the way that my predecessors went to make sure that people buckle up. And in America today, 85% of the people get in their car and buckle up, thanks to click it or ticket and good enforcement. One of the drunk most successful driving, public health campaigns around, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And drunk driving, the same thing. You know, people said you could never get drunk drivers off the road. Because of my predecessors' efforts, we're getting a lot of drunk drivers off the road. I want it to be said that when we walk out the door, there will be a keen awareness in America that you cannot text and drive, you cannot use a cell phone and drive safely. You can't do it. And when you do, people get killed and people are injured. And the reason I've called it an epidemic is because everybody in America has got a cell phone. And every person that has a cell phone has used it while they're driving and they don't drive safe. Uh, and uh, we're off to a good start, but we have a long way to go. I was looking at the, just reviewing all the th issues that you've been involved in. Mm -hmm. I mean, the stimulus money, the auto uh, uh, restructuring, I was going to say bailouts, but I know yeah. you're supposed to say restructuring. Um, we, we were just discussing here with texting and driving. Yeah, you, look, uh, nobody you, has you know, done more for the automobile industry in America in the history of the automobile industry than President Obama. Yeah, let's talk you know, about a lot, that. What's a lot, the, what's a lot the of people, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of people criticize the president. You know, you're bailing out the auto companies. You're giving them too much money. You're, yeah. you're trying to become, you know, the, the auto dealer of the, of the country. Uh, that, it was, it was a lot of very, very misguided criticism that now people realize GM is putting out an IPO, which means they'll generate some money mm -hmm. and they'll be able to pay back. And I've already started paying back the loans. Chrysler back on their feet again. There was a debate early in the administration, obviously, about how to handle GM and Chrysler. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the economic advisors uh, uh, thought, you know, we can save GM, but to save GM, it might be best not to, to, to give any further support to, to, to Chrysler. 
you know, because the Chrysler mm -hmm. buyers, they're not going to walk, you know, they're going to, but they might go buy GM cars. True. And obviously, President Obama sided with, uh, with, with helping GM and Chrysler. Mm -hmm. were, you part, were you part of that decision-making process? And is there anything you can tell us about sort of how difficult the decision that was for, for the president? I mean, it must well, look, it, up there it as was one of the toughest calls he had to make. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it was a big debate. I mean, this was a big investment, a big, you know, a big leap of faith. that if yeah. we, we put taxpayer money into these companies. What does it do? Well, we know it saved jobs. Yeah. Well, there's no question. Uh, Thousands of jobs were saved. Uh, these are two companies that go back as almost to the beginning of the automobile industry. And you, I think the feeling was we just can't let them go under. We, yeah. we, we got to throw them a lifeline. Hopefully it works. It did work. Good management, new people in place. And uh, these companies are paying the money back. One of the complications up on the Hill when they were trying to do cap and trade this year is that a heck of a time figuring out how to deal with the transportation sector um, and how to, how to fit those guys into the, the overall cap and trade program rather than getting the oil company, oil industry to pay for their emissions, we're going to, we're going to hit the car companies with fuel efficiency standards again. Were you involved in any of the debate over how to deal with the transportation sector if, if, you had, if we had done a cap and trade uh, program? We EPA and DOT had to get a common standard. So by 2012, the standard is 36 miles per gallon. We, we were able to do that because the president said, get it done, signed an executive order. That's done. Everybody knows what the standard is. There's no, calif there's no waivers for any state. Right. Now we're working beyond. We're going from 2017 and beyond, and we're working with the EPA to come, try and come up with a standard. Does the fact that we're not going to have any kind of cap on carbon, at least not in the, in the near future, does that affect how aggressive can, how far can you go? Uh, well, uh, we're, stay tuned. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to, we're working very hard on it right now with our friends at EPA, and we'll be having some announcements, I think, um, soon. How does that issue relate to what the EPA has to do on the regulation of, of greenhouse gases? My, my I mean, point. Separate, I, I know that you said. Yeah, no, issues, my yeah. point. The point I was trying to make is I, I don't think the EPA is going to be going off yeah. on their own see, without right. consultation right. with either members of the Green Cabinet or people that are directly affected by these things. I think there'll be a lot of consultation yeah. before they decide to do this or that. And it, it really comes from the leadership of the president, just to say, you know, we, we got to be of one, one mind, one voice here. And uh, so I, I don't see them, yeah. you know, doing things without consultation with a lot of the rest of us. In the modern presidency, it seems like more and more decision making gets concentrated in the White House. And there have been cabinet secretaries that have been famously frustrated with their time, mm -hmm. uh, where they, they felt a little isolated from where the... Where the, where the action actually was. What's, what's, what's your think, experience you know, been, and how does it compare with other periods in I your I think this is the ultimate team uh, opportunity that, that I've ever seen in the 30 years of public service. And there's not this kind of, you know, infighting or backbiting or whatever that maybe you've seen with other administrations. I have never seen that. I've been in this job now for more than 18 months. It really is a, a, a team uh, kind of uh, management style, right from the top. And... Uh, and, and so, you know, we have lots of conversations with the White House. There's lots of discussions. It's not, you know, my way or the highway. It's let's hear what people have to say. Here is, is this how we solve the problem? And then, you know, once the decision is made, then you've got to be a part of that. Uh, you're part of that decision, whether your point was taken or not. And, uh, and you haven't seen stories about cabinet members that, you know, are off the reservation or trying to do their own thing or have their own agenda. This really has been a really a great team approach. And I, I think the American people should really realize the president has really been a good leader on this, really holding us together, being a good magnet, knowing what his agenda was. Uh, I mean, all of us were involved in the health care debate. You wouldn't think that we would be here at DOT. Is that right? Even, even Yeah. Here? I mean, they asked me to call some of my friends and talk to people and talk about health care and and, uh, you know, try and uh, find some support for it. And uh, did, uh, who did you have to call? Oh, a whole bunch of people. Republicans yeah. on the Hill? Yes, sure. Uh huh. Both, both, uh, both House and Senate members. Yeah. And how did it, how did it go? Well, look at. I mean, what was the reaction? We we wish there had been uh, you know more support uh, from Republicans, but uh, 
The fact is that what would they say? What would they, what would they tell you during that period? Would they say? Would it, would they say? Sorry, my constituents just can't go for this. Would, would they say the Republican leadership won't let me vote for this? Would, would they say I don't believe in it? What was the argument? Well, look, you I, heard I the think most? as as I've known for a long time, and maybe people don't really appreciate, uh, most members of Congress are very thoughtful. They yeah. they really thought this through and yeah. and really carefully considered. They they knew that this was a big thing maybe the biggest piece of legislation that in their political career and they they you know they really they they tried to get it right and so we did we you know we just kind of worked through those things and talked through them and uh you know in the end got a couple of republicans in the in the senate and uh, couldn't find anybody in the house but it was not without trying and and uh without real careful uh consideration has it been has it been strange to watch the direction the republican party has gone off on uh while you're, while you're well, being a member of the Obama administration? Because well, so much of what's you know, happening the, in that party is a reaction yeah, against the you The window guys. dressing part yeah. of it where you have leaders just simply saying, you know, we're not going to support any of this, yeah. uh, is different than talking to the rank and file. I, I mean, I used to be a member of the rank and file, and yeah. I, I've talked to these folks. It's like when I... When I gave you the examples yeah, before, you were famously not. A, you were a member of the rank of hell, but you were famously not a, uh, you know, a a, a hundred percent party man, right? No, I mean, I, mean, I that, tried to do a. You, you didn't. Know. In Ninety-four. You were one of the only Republicans that didn't sign the contract right. with America. I mean, so right. I mean, you, your whole reputation was in right. was independence from the Republican leadership. Yeah, well, which is that. So you're, what you're saying is there's there's a bit of a split between the rank and file guys and the leadership. I, I, that's exactly right, yeah. and I, I think that uh, people should should realize that. Uh, the rank and file are very deliberative people. They're thoughtful people. A lot more thoughtful than I think they're given credit for. And they don't just always go lockstep with what the leaders say. The leaders have a responsibility. The rank and file have a responsibility also to their constituents and to thoughtful uh, consideration. It does seem, though, at a certain point last year, the leadership started to exercise a lot more control over mm -hmm. the Republican caucus. I mean, mm -hmm. at least in the Senate. I mean, Early on, the administration ha had some success with right. forging some bipartisanship. Yeah. What was the, did you you watch that up close? Was, what, what was the what was the turning point last year? Was it the health care debate? Was it the well? Summer I don't know. Tea I think parties? all of the suggestions. When, when yeah, I think all of the suggestions that uh, Republicans uh, made to the administration, they tried to comply with. You know, they held a big summit at the White House. They got everybody in the room together. They listened to everybody's ideas. Yeah. They tried to incorporate them. I think the president really uh, has has tried to incorporate Republican ideas, and in the end, they they decided that it wasn't wasn't going to be, and uh, at least on health care anyway. One uh, question that I know a lot of people will be interested mm -hmm. in, since we were talking about your friend Rahm Emanuel. Mm -hmm. What do you uh, what do you think he's going? What do you think he should do, and what do you think he's going to do? Well, look, this is a, a tough call. I think yeah. opportunity. This isn't a walk for him, right? I mean, this is like it's a, a pretty tough race, no? Well, I think the tough decision is deciding what to do. Right. That's the toughest decision. He's yeah. got, if not uh, one of the best jobs, uh, certainly one of the top five jobs <laughs> that are considered the best jobs. Uh, in this administration, yeah. chief of staff to the president, yeah. in a very historic administration, working for a friend, a longtime friend. I mean, that th th those those kind of opportunities only come around once. But yeah. running for mayor only comes around once in a political lifetime in Chicago. Especially in Chicago. <laughs> right. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see, you know, what he decides. And I know he's talking to a lot of people and uh, yeah. and really trying to trying to figure it out. It'll be a big loss. For the president and a big loss for the administration. He's been an extraordinarily gifted uh, chief of staff and, and one of the people that has followed the president's lead on making sure that all voices are heard, yeah. making sure that everybody's in the room, making sure that you know things are you know done in a way that are, are very inclusive and collaborative. And what about you? Uh, midterms coming up, mm -hmm. it's a natural point for uh, cabinet secretaries to turn over what's your uh, what's your plan well look at I like this job and uh, we just gotten a very strong signal from the president that he wants to do a six-year transportation bill which is going to have bipartisan support Senator Voinovich from Ohio yeah. came out in the last few days and said he was going to support it a Republican mm -hmm. he likes what we're doing we've been we've been waiting a while for from for a signal from the president that we're going to do a long-term transportation program 
Uh, obviously, I want to be around for all of that. But yeah. look, I serve at the pleasure of the president. As long as the president thinks I'm doing a good job, I'll be around here. All right, good. We'll leave it there. Thanks, Thank thanks a lot for joining Thank us. We really much. appreciate it.